It was a crisp autumn evening in Maplewood, a small town where everyone knew each other. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over the neatly manicured lawns. For Clara, a recent transplant from the city, the quiet charm of Maplewood was a welcome change. However, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about her new home. Her neighbor, Mrs. Grimsby, had a reputation. The older woman uh, rarely left her house, a dilapidated Victorian that loomed ominously next door, its paint peeling and windows darkened. The children in the neighborhood whispered tales of Mrs. Grimsby's eccentricities, how she talked to herself, how her garden seemed to wilt while the rest of the town flourished, and how her shadowy figure could be seen moving past her curtains at odd hours. One chilly evening, as Clara returned from work, she noticed Mrs. Grimsby standing in her yard, staring directly at her with an unsettling gaze. Clara waved, but the woman didn't respond. Instead, she continued to watch, her thin lips curling into a strange smile. Clara hurried inside, the image of Mrs. Grimsby lingering in her mind like a bad dream. Days turned into weeks, and the days grew shorter. Clara began to feel an inexplicable dread whenever she glanced at Mrs. Grimsby's house. It wasn't just the woman's eerie presence, it was the whispers she sometimes heard at night. They started as soft murmurs, almost like a lullaby, drifting through the thin walls of her old house. But they grew louder, a cacophony of incoherent voices that clawed at her sanity. One night, unable to sleep, Clara decided to investigate. She crept into her living room, the moon casting a silvery glow through the window. As she stood there, listening to the whispers that seemed to beckon her, she caught a glimpse of movement outside. Mrs. Grimsby was in her garden, moving with an unnatural grace among the dead flowers. Curiosity peaked, Clara slipped on her coat and stepped outside, the cold air biting at her skin. She approached the fence, peering through the slats. Mrs. Grimsby was now kneeling in the dirt, her fingers clawing at the earth as if searching for something. Mrs. Grimsby? Clara called softly, unsure of what to expect. The woman's head snapped up, her eyes wide and wild. You shouldn't be here, she hissed, her voice like gravel. It's not safe. Clara took a step back, fear creeping into her chest. I just wanted to know if you were okay. I'm fine, but they aren't. Mrs. Grimsby's voice rose, and Clara could see the veins in her neck pulsing. They're angry. You have to leave. Clara turned, her heart racing, and hurried back to her house. She locked the door behind her, breathless, convinced she had narrowly escaped something sinister. That night, she locked her windows and pulled the curtains tight, trying to drown out the whispers that echoed in her mind. But the next day, as she ventured out for groceries, she noticed something strange. Mrs. Grimsby's house was quiet, too quiet. The usual shadows flitting past the windows were gone, replaced by an eerie stillness. It felt as if the entire house had been drained of life. As Clara returned home, a shiver ran down her spine. She caught sight of a newspaper clipping pinned to her door. It was an old article about a family that had lived in Mrs. Grimsby's house years ago, a family that had mysteriously vanished without a trace. The last line sent chills through her. Witnesses reported seeing shadows moving inside the home long after the family disappeared. That night, Clara couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. She decided to confront Mrs. Unmistake Grimsby one last time. Armed with courage and a flashlight, she made her way to the ominous house. Mrs. Grimsby, she called, her voice trembling. She knocked on the door, which creaked open as if beckoning her inside. The air inside was thick with dust and decay, and Clara's heart raced as she stepped into the darkness. Hello? She ventured, her voice echoing off the walls. She moved deeper into the house, her flashlight beam flickering across faded photographs. They depicted a family, smiling faces that seemed to fade into shadows. Suddenly, Clara heard a rustling sound. She turned to see Mrs. Grimsby standing in the hallway, her expression vacant, her body swaying slightly as if caught in a trance. You shouldn't have come here, she whispered hollow. Where is everyone? Clara demanded, her courage faltering. The shadows. They took them, Mrs. Grimsby said, tears streaming down her cheeks. They want more. At that moment, Clara felt a cold breeze sweep through the room, extinguishing her flashlight. Darkness enveloped her, and she felt hands reaching out from the shadows, pulling her closer. Panic surged as she fought against the unseen grip. Get out! Run! Mrs. Grimsby screamed, her voice echoing with desperation. 
but Clara was paralyzed, caught between the weight of fear and the grip of the shadows. With one final surge of strength, Clara broke free and stumbled out of the house station, the whispers of the shadows fading behind her. She ran all the way home, locking the door and bolting it shut. The horror of what she had experienced etched into her mind. The next day, Clara decided to leave Maplewood. She packed her things, her heart heavy with the memories of that haunted house and its strange, sorrowful neighbor. As she drove away, she glanced in the rearview mirror, catching a glimpse of Mrs. Grimsby standing in her yard, watching. But this time, there was no smile, only the sorrowful gaze of a woman lost to the shadows. As Clara disappeared down the winding road, the whispers began again, echoing through the quiet town, a reminder of the darkness that lingered just next door. Story number two. In the small, quiet town of Maplewood, where every street echoed with familiarity, there was an old house at the end of Willow Lane. It stood apart from the others, its shutters hung askew, and the once vibrant paint had faded to a dull gray. The neighbors rarely spoke about the house, but they whispered about its occupant, Mr. Thornton. He was a reclusive man who kept to himself, always seen through the grimy window, muttering to shadows. Sarah and her family had just moved into the neighborhood. Eager to fit in, she decided to invite the mysterious neighbor over for dinner, hoping to break the ice. Her parents were hesitant, but finally agreed. On the appointed evening, they set the table with care and prepared a simple meal. Just as they were about to sit down, a loud knock echoed through the house. Mr. Thornton stood at the door, looking more spectral than ever. His thin frame was draped in a long, tattered coat and his gray hair hung limply around his face. Despite the unease that gripped Sarah's parents, they welcomed him in with forced smiles. Over dinner, the atmosphere grew tense. Mr. Thornton barely spoke, only lifting his head occasionally to gaze at Sarah with piercing eyes that seemed to look right through her. As the night wore on, she felt an overwhelming sense of dread wash over her. Her parents tried to make small talk, but their words fell flat. Suddenly, Mr. Thornton asked Sarah a question that sent chills down her spine. Do you believe in ghosts, Sarah? He whispered, his voice raspy and low. Um, not really, she replied nervously, glancing at her parents for reassurance. They exchanged worried looks. Mr. Thornton leaned closer, and the air around them felt heavy. You should. They can be quite persistent, he said, his eyes flickering with something unsettling. Just then, the lights flickered. Everyone froze, a heavy silence descending upon the room. Mr. Thornton chuckled softly, and it sent a shiver down Sarah's spine. They're just saying hello, he murmured, glancing towards the window. As the evening progressed, Sarah couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. After Mr. Thornton left, her parents hurriedly cleaned up, their faces pale. He's just an odd man, that's all, her mother said, but Sarah felt differently. She couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. The following night, Sarah heard a soft tapping at her window. Curiosity peaked. She crept downstairs, peeking through the curtains. To her horror, she saw Mr. Thornton standing in the moonlight, staring at her. His mouth moved, but no sound came out. A wave of panic surged through her, and she rushed back to her room, locking the window tight. Over the next few days, things only grew stranger. Sarah noticed that Mr. Thornton had started appearing outside her house at odd hours, always staring, always silent. The atmosphere in her home shifted. Her parents began to argue more, their nerves frayed. Sarah felt an invisible weight pressing down on her, an unseen force growing more sinister with each passing day. One stormy night when lightning illuminated the sky, Sarah awoke to hear whispers outside her window. She listened intently, recognizing the familiar voice, Mr. Thornton's. She peered through the rain-soaked glass, her heart racing. The figure was there, soaked to the bone, calling her name softly. Sarah, come play with me, he beckoned, his voice echoing eerily against the thunder. She felt an inexplicable pull, a need to respond, but a voice inside her screamed to run. Gathering her courage, she rushed to her parents' room, shaking them awake. Mom, Mr. Thornton is outside. They groaned in response, dismissing her fears. Frustrated and scared, she returned to her room. But as she lay in bed, a sudden chill enveloped her, and she felt a presence beside her. In the dim light of her room, she saw him, Mr. Thornton, standing at the foot of her bed, his hollow eyes boring into hers. Why didn't you come out, Sarah? He asked, tilting his head. I wanted to show you something. Frozen in fear, she stammered. What do you want? Your family has something that belongs to me, he said, his voice cold and unyielding. 
I just want it back. With that, he pointed a bony finger towards her closet. Sarah turned slowly, heart pounding, and saw the door slightly ajar. A dark shadow seemed to writhe within, pulsating like a living thing. Terrified, she turned back to Mr. Thornton, but he was gone. Desperate to understand, Sarah crept to the closet, her hands trembling. Inside, she found an old, dusty box with strange symbols etched on it. As she reached for it, like a sudden flash of memory hit her, her parents arguing about a family heirloom, something Mr. Thornton had lost long ago. Suddenly, the lights flickered again, and Sarah heard Mr. Thornton's voice, more urgent this time. You need to give it back. I can't rest until you do. Realizing the connection, Sarah took a deep breath. She gathered her courage and yelled, Fine, I'll return it. Instantly, the room went cold, and the shadow in the closet seemed to shift, retreating momentarily. The next day, trembling but determined, Sarah approached Mr. Thornton's house. She knocked hesitantly, the door creaking open as if inviting her in. The air inside was thick with dust and despair. Mr. Thornton, she called out, her voice barely above a whisper. He appeared in the hallway, his eyes wide with anticipation. You've come. I found something that belongs to you, she said, handing him the box. His hands trembled as he accepted it, and for a moment, a look of peace washed over his gaunt face. Thank you, dear child, he said softly. Now I can finally rest. In that instant, the room felt lighter, as if a heavy burden had been lifted. As Mr. Thornton turned to leave, a faint smile crossed his lips. You're braver than I thought. When Sarah returned home, she felt an inexplicable calm wash over her. The shadows that had loomed over her house seemed to dissipate. Her parents were busy in the kitchen, laughter spilling out into the hall. But as she settled back into her routine, she couldn't shake the feeling that Mr. Thornton had not truly left. Late at night, she would sometimes hear whispers, soft and soothing, reminding her of the man who had once haunted her dreams. Weeks passed, and one evening, as she gazed out the window, she noticed the old house had changed. The shutters were now firmly closed, and the air around it felt peaceful. Sarah smiled, knowing that perhaps some neighbors could finally find their peace, even after death. Story number three. In the small town of Willow Creek, where everyone knew everyone else, there was an old house at the end of Elm Street. Its white paint was peeling, and the garden was overgrown with weeds. The townsfolk spoke of it in hushed tones, claiming it was haunted. The last resident, Mrs. Hargrove, had vanished one stormy night, leaving the house abandoned. A few months later, the Thompson family moved in. They were excited about their new home, especially 12-year-old Lily. She was a curious girl, always seeking adventure. Her parents, though wary of the house's past, brushed off the stories as mere superstition. One evening, while her parents were busy unpacking, Lily ventured outside to explore. As she wandered the overgrown yard, she noticed something odd. A figure stood in the window of the house next door. It was a woman, pale and gaunt, with hollow eyes staring directly at her. The woman raised a finger to her lips, shushing Lily as if warning her to stay quiet. Startled, Lily blinked, and the figure vanished. When she ran back inside, she told her parents, but they laughed it off. Just your imagination, honey, her mother said, ruffling her hair. But Lily couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. That night, after her parents had gone to bed, Lily lay in her room, staring at the ceiling. She heard a faint tapping sound coming from the window. Curiosity peaked. She crept out of bed and peeked through the curtains. To her horror, the woman from the neighbor's house was standing there, her face distorted in a ghastly grin. Lily gasped and stumbled back, her heart racing. The woman pointed to her and then to the door of the house. Feeling a strange compulsion, Lily tiptoed downstairs, her breath hitching in her throat with every creak of the floorboards. As she reached the front door, it swung open with a gentle push. Outside, the moonlight illuminated the figure standing in the yard. The woman beckoned her with an eerie gesture. Compelled by a mix of fear and curiosity, Lily stepped outside. The air was cold, and the wind made whispered secrets in her ears. The woman turned and walked toward the abandoned house. Lily followed, her footsteps hesitant but unyielding. As they approached, the front door creaked open, and the woman vanished inside. Lily stood at the threshold, her instincts screaming for her to turn back. But she stepped inside, compelled by an unknown force. The interior was dark and musty, the air thick with dust. She felt a chill run down her spine, but she pressed on, calling out, Hello? 
No answer, just silence. Suddenly she heard soft weeping echoing through the hallway. It seemed to come from the living room. Cautiously, she approached and peeked inside. The room was empty, save for a dusty old rocking chair that creaked on its own. The weeping continued, now more desperate, piercing her heart with sorrow. Who's there? Lily called out, her voice trembling. The weeping stopped. Then a soft voice, like a whisper carried by the wind, said, Help me! Lily stepped into the room, her eyes darting around, searching for the source. What do you need help with? she asked. I am trapped, the voice replied, sorrowful and haunting. I need someone to remember me. Lily's heart raced as the realization hit her. This was Mrs. Hargrove, the neighbor who had disappeared. Why are you trapped? she asked. The darkness in this house has held me captive since I was taken. I need you to find my story and tell it. Only then can I be free. Lily felt a strange connection to the spirit. How can I help you? Find the box, the voice urged. The box beneath the floorboards in the bedroom. Inside, you will find the truth. With newfound determination, Lily rushed to the bedroom, her heart pounding with each step. She pried up the floorboards and found a small dust-covered box. Inside were letters, photographs, and an old journal. She quickly scanned the pages, revealing the truth about Mrs. Hargrove's life, the loss of her husband, her struggles, and the mysterious circumstances surrounding her disappearance. Just then, the temperature dropped, and Lily felt a presence behind her. The ghostly figure of Mrs. Hargrove appeared, her face softening. Thank you, dear child, she whispered. You have given me hope. Lily could feel the air shifting, a weight lifting from the room. The spirit smiled, her expression finally at peace. Now I can rest, she said, before fading away. As dawn broke, Lily found herself alone in the house, the box clutched tightly in her hands. The sun streamed through the windows, illuminating the once dark corners of the home. She could feel a warmth enveloping her, as if the house was breathing again. When she returned home, she told her parents everything. They listened intently, their expressions shifting from disbelief to concern. But Lily knew what she had to do. She went back to the old house, sharing Mrs. Hargrove's story with the townsfolk, ensuring her memory would live on. From that day forward, the stories of the haunted house faded into the background, replaced by tales of a woman who had been forgotten, finally at peace. And the Thompsons never felt alone in their new home, for they knew the spirit of Mrs. Hargrove watched over them, grateful for the girl who had remembered her. Story number four. Emma had always been wary of change. After years of living in the same quaint neighborhood, the sudden move of her elderly neighbor, Mrs. Thompson, left a palpable void. So when the for sale sign finally came down, curiosity peaked. Who would replace Mrs. Thompson, the sweet old woman who had been a constant in Emma's life? The new occupants arrived late one evening, their moving truck rumbling through the quiet street. Emma watched from her living room window as a tall, shadowy figure emerged from the cab. The figure seemed to glide rather than walk, cloaked in dark clothes. A chill crawled up Emma's spine, but she brushed it off. Perhaps it was just her imagination, fueled by the strange events of late, items misplaced, odd noises at night, and a growing sense of unease in her once peaceful home. The next morning, Emma decided to introduce herself. She walked over to the house next door, which still smelled of fresh paint and new beginnings. The door creaked open, revealing a man in his 40s. He had a sharp jawline and piercing blue eyes that seemed to scrutinize her every move. Hi, I'm Emma, your neighbor, she said, forcing a smile. Hello, he replied, his voice smooth but lacking warmth. I'm Mr. Blackwood. Emma sensed something unsettling in his demeanor. He didn't invite her in, nor did he offer any pleasantries. Instead, he stood there, watching her as if she were a puzzle he couldn't quite solve. Days turned into weeks, and Emma's initial curiosity about Mr. Blackwood morphed into a deep-seated apprehension. He rarely left his house, and when he did, it was at odd hours, long after the sun had set. Sometimes she caught glimpses of him through his curtains, pacing back and forth like a caged animal. The other neighbors started to whisper. Mrs. Leck, Jenkins across the street, claimed to have seen strange lights flickering in the windows at night. Tommy, the neighborhood kid, swore he saw Mr. Blackwood talking to himself in the yard, gesturing wildly as if arguing with an invisible presence. One rainy evening, Emma decided to confront her fears. She knocked on Mr. Blackwood's door, hoping to quell the rising tide of suspicion. 
The door opens slowly, revealing the man with disheveled hair and a tired expression. Can I help you? He asked, his voice a mixture of annoyance and fatigue. I just wanted to check in. We've missed you at the block parties, Emma offered, trying to sound friendly. Not interested, he replied curtly before closing the door, leaving Emma standing in the rain, feeling both foolish and unnerved. That night, the storm raged outside, thunder rumbling like an angry beast. Emma lay in bed, trying to drown out the sound of the rain against her window when she heard it. The faint sound of music. It was hauntingly beautiful, a slow piano melody drifting through the darkness. Emma sat up, her heart racing. It was coming from Mr. Blackwood's house. Driven by a mix of curiosity and dread, she slipped on her raincoat and ventured out into the storm. The music grew louder as she approached the house, its notes echoing through the night air. She stood outside, the rain pouring down her face, and looked through the window. What she saw sent a shiver down her spine. Mr. Blackwood sat at a grand piano, playing with his eyes closed, lost in the melody. But around him, the room was filled with shadows, figures flickering in and out of existence, their features obscured. They swayed to the music, their movements unsettling, as if they were tethered to some unseen force. Emma stepped back, heart pounding. She turned to run, but the shadows seemed to sense her fear. A cold gust of wind swept through the yard, pulling her back toward the house. Desperate, she stumbled away, sprinting back to her home, the haunting melody echoing in her mind. The next day, Emma decided to gather the other neighbors. They convened at Mrs. Jenkins' house, a palpable tension in the air. After sharing their unsettling experiences, the group agreed they needed to approach Mr. Blackwood as a united front. That evening, they marched over, determined to confront him. As they reached his door, they hesitated, a wave of doubt washing over them. Mrs. Jenkins knocked loudly, and the door creaked open, revealing Mr. Blackwood with an unreadable expression. What do you want? He asked, annoyance creeping into his tone. We're concerned about you, Emma began, trying to keep her voice steady. We've heard some strange things. I don't need your concern, he interrupted, his voice low and chilling. Stay away from me. Before they could respond, the door slammed shut, leaving the group standing in shocked silence. They dispersed, unease heavy in the air. That night, Emma lay in bed, haunted by the image of the shadows and the music. The following day, she noticed that the neighborhood was unusually quiet. When she glanced outside, she saw an eerie fog creeping through the streets, swallowing everything in its path. But what caught her attention was the absence of Mr. F. Blackwood. His house stood dark and silent, the curtains drawn tight. Days turned into a week and still no sign of him. The neighbors began to worry more. One evening, Emma decided to check on him once more. With her heart in her throat, she approached the front door, knocking softly. No answer. She tried the knob, and to her surprise, it turned easily. The door swung open, revealing an untouched house. Dust coated the furniture, and the air was stale. She stepped inside, her pulse racing as she called out, Mr. Blackwood? No response. Emma ventured deeper into the house, feeling the shadows close in around her. The living room was empty, but the sound of the piano echoed faintly from somewhere in the back. Following the sound, she found herself in a dimly lit room where the piano sat eerily polished amidst the decay. As she approached, she noticed a small frayed photograph on the piano. It was of a family, a smiling man, woman, and two children, all gone too soon. Suddenly, the music began again, but this time, it was dissonant and chaotic. Shadows began to swirl around her, dark and indistinct, whispering her name in a chorus of voices. Emma felt a grip on her heart, a pressure building as the shadows tightened their hold. Panic surged through her and she turned to flee, but the shadows seemed to stretch and grasp, pulling her back toward the piano. With every ounce of strength, she fought against the darkness, breaking free from their grasp. She stumbled out of the house, slamming the door behind her. As she stood on the porch, gasping for breath, the music abruptly stopped. The shadows receded and a heavy silence fell over the neighborhood. Emma looked back at the house, heart pounding in her chest. From that day on, Mr. Blackwood's house remained abandoned. The whispers in the neighborhood faded, but Emma knew something sinister lingered there. Waiting for the next curious soul to cross its threshold, in the quiet of the night, she could still hear the echoes of the piano, a haunting reminder that some neighbors are best left alone. Story number five. 
In the sleepy town of Eldridge Hollow, nestled between rolling hills and dense forests, stood a quaint neighborhood. Among its picturesque houses was the old Whitmore residence, a once vibrant home that now lay shrouded in shadows. The Whitmores had moved away years ago, leaving behind a ghostly silence that made the neighbors uneasy. No one dared to linger too long near that house, especially since the stories began circulating about its last occupant, Mrs. Whitmore. Mrs. Whitmore had been a sweet old lady known for her garden and freshly baked pies. But as she grew older, she became increasingly reclusive. Neighbors whispered that she spoke to shadows and that her once lush garden became a maze of thorns and wilted flowers. One evening, she was found lifeless in her home, a look of terror frozen on her face. From that day on, strange occurrences began to haunt the neighborhood. Now, Emily and her family had just moved into the house next door, blissfully unaware of the dark history that lay just beyond their fence. Emily, a curious and adventurous 13-year-old, was excited to explore her new home. On the first day, she noticed the Whitmore house. It loomed over her like a dark sentinel, its broken windows seeming to watch her. As the days passed, Emily's curiosity turned into fascination. She often found herself gazing at the dilapidated garden, wondering what secrets lay buried in its twisted vines. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting an orange glow over the neighborhood, she noticed a flicker of movement in the garden. Intrigued, she decided to investigate. Creeping through the tall grass, she reached the rusted gate that led into the Whitmore yard. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth and decay. As she stepped through, the atmosphere shifted. A chill ran down her spine, but she pressed on, determined to uncover the mystery. In the center of the garden stood an ancient oak tree, its gnarled branches reaching out like skeletal fingers. At its base lay a weathered stone statue of a woman, her face serene yet haunting. Emily approached, captivated by the delicate features that had somehow endured the years. It was then that she felt it, a pair of eyes watching her. Startled, she turned but found no one there. The hairs on the back of her neck prickled and an unsettling feeling washed over her. Shaking off the dread, she took a step back, intending to leave when she heard a soft whisper, help me. Heart racing, Emily scanned the yard. The wind rustled the leaves and shadows danced in the fading light. Who's there? She called out, her voice trembling. Help me, free me, the whisper echoed, growing fainter. A cold breeze swept through the garden for a second and Emily felt an overwhelming urge to obey. She stepped closer to the statue, compelled by a force she couldn't explain. She reached out to touch it, her fingers brushing against the cool stone. Suddenly, the ground trembled and the air thickened. Emily gasped as the statue's eyes seemed to glow and a spectral figure began to emerge, a woman in a flowing white gown, her face eerily similar to that of the statue. Thank you for finding me the apparition said, her voice a melodic whisper. Emily stumbled back, fear gripping her heart. Who are you? She stammered. I am Eliza Whitmore, the last of my line, the ghostly figure replied, her expression both sad and pleading. I was trapped here, bound to this earth by a dark curse. Only someone pure of heart could free me. But how can I help you? Emily asked, her mind racing with disbelief. The key lies within the house, Eliza said, her voice barely above a whisper. You must find the locket hidden in my old room. It holds the power to break the curse. Emily hesitated, glancing back at her own house. The thought of entering the Whitmore home sent shivers down her spine, but she couldn't turn her back on a plea for help. I'll do it, she said, stealing her resolve. That night, as her family slept, Emily gathered her courage and crept out of her house. The moon cast a silvery light on the Whitmore residence, illuminating the cracked door that hung ajar. Taking a deep breath, she stepped inside. The air was thick with dust and the smell of mildew. Shadows danced along the walls and the floor creaked ominously beneath her feet. Emily moved cautiously through the darkened rooms, her heart pounding in her chest. She finally reached the staircase, the wood cold and splintered beneath her fingers. In the upstairs bedroom, she found a bed covered in a faded quilt and a dresser adorned with cracked mirrors. As she searched through the drawers, her fingers brushed against something cold and metallic. Pulling it out, she gasped, a delicate silver locket engraved with intricate designs. Is this it? She whispered, feeling a surge of energy pulsate through her. Suddenly, the room grew icy, and Eliza's figure materialized beside her. Yes! You found it! The ghost exclaimed. 
Now you must wear it to break the curse. Without hesitation, Emily clasped the locket around her neck. A bright light enveloped her, and she felt Eliza's presence merging with her own. Together we will be free, the ghost said, her voice strong now. In an instant, Emily was transported back to the garden. The statue glowed and the garden transformed. Flowers bloomed vibrant colors and the air filled with the sweet scent of jasmine. Eliza stood beside her, now radiating with light. Her chains of darkness shattered. Thank you, dear child, Eliza said, her eyes filled with gratitude. You have freed me from my torment. I can finally rest. With that, she turned towards the glowing light that emerged from the oak tree, her figure dissipating into a mist of shimmering stars. Emily watched in awe as the last remnants of darkness faded, leaving only tranquility behind. The next day, the Whitmore house was no longer a source of dread. The neighborhood had changed, the air felt lighter, and a sense of peace settled over Eldridge Hollow. As Emily looked out her window, she saw a beautiful garden blooming next door, vibrant and alive. The whispers of the past had quieted, and in their place, the spirit of Eliza Whitmore had found her peace. Story number six. In a quiet suburban neighborhood where neatly trimmed lawns and picket fences painted a picture of idyllic living, a new family moved in next door to the Mullins. The Johnsons were a family of three, a father, a mother, and a teenage daughter named Sarah. They quickly settled into their home, but something about them struck the Mullins as odd. Mrs. Mullen often noticed the Johnsons through the living room window. The parents rarely left the house, and Sarah seemed to wander the yard aimlessly, as if searching for something. Despite their proximity, the families barely exchanged greetings, and the Johnsons kept to themselves, shrouded in an unsettling silence. One evening, as Mrs. Mullen was preparing dinner, she glanced out the window and noticed Sarah standing in the yard, staring at their house. The girl's expression was distant, her eyes wide and unfocused, as if she were in a trance. Mrs. Flick. Mullen felt a chill run down her spine. The girl was too still, too quiet. That night, restless, Mrs. Mullen sat in her living room, her mind racing. She couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong with the Johnsons. After a few more days of odd behavior, she decided to investigate. The next afternoon, she approached their house, hoping to introduce herself. As she walked up the path, she noticed the front door was slightly ajar. She hesitated, then knocked softly. Hello? Is anyone home? There was no answer. The door creaked open further, revealing a dark hallway lined with family photographs. Curiosity got the better of her, and she stepped inside. Hello? She called again, her voice echoing in the silence. The air felt heavy, as if it had been stale for days. She wandered deeper into the house, peeking into rooms that were untouched and covered in dust. It looked as if the family had just left, but the atmosphere was wrong, ominous, as if the house itself was holding its breath. In the living room, she saw a small table covered with strange trinkets, old dolls, broken clocks, and a few faded photographs of the family. One photo caught her eye, Sarah, but her face was scratched out as if someone wanted to erase her from existence. Suddenly, a chill swept through the room and the lights flickered. Mrs. Mullen turned to leave, but as she did, she heard a soft whisper, a child's voice calling her name. Help me. Please help me. Terrified, she stumbled backward, nearly tripping over a chair. She turned to leave, but felt an invisible force holding her in place. Who's there? She shouted, her heart pounding. The whisper came again, more urgent this time. Help me. Gathering her courage, Mrs. Mullen asked, What do you need? I'm trapped, the voice replied, growing stronger. In the basement. Please help me. Against her better judgment, Mrs. Mullen followed the voice to the basement door and its handle cold and rusted. Taking a deep breath, she opened it and descended the creaky steps. The air was thick and musty, and the darkness enveloped her like a shroud. As she reached the bottom, she saw a faint glow emanating from the far corner of the room. In the light stood Sarah, her face pale and eyes wide with fear. You found me, she whispered, tears streaming down her cheeks. Sarah, what happened to you? Mrs. Mullen rushed to her side, but as she reached out, Sarah recoiled, shaking her head. I'm not safe here. They won't let me leave, she said, glancing nervously around the dark room. Who? Your parents? Mrs. Mullen asked, dread pooling in her stomach. Sarah nodded. They're not who they seem. They're, they're not my real parents. They're keeping me here, waiting for something. Mrs. Mullen felt a sense of urgency. What can I do to help you? 
The only way to escape is to find the key, Sarah said, her voice trembling. It's hidden in the living room, but you have to hurry. They'll be back soon. Mrs. Mullen raced back upstairs, her heart pounding. She searched the living room frantically, tearing through drawers and knocking over objects until her eyes landed on the coffee table. Underneath, she spotted a small, ornate key half buried in dust. Grabbing it, she dashed back to the basement. Here, she shouted, holding it up. But as she turned to Sarah, she froze in terror. The girl was gone, and in her place stood two shadowy figures, Sarah's parents, their faces twisted and unnatural. Did you think you could take her away from us? The father hissed, his eyes dark as voids. Mrs. Mullen backed away, heart racing. I just wanted to help her. You shouldn't have come here, the mother said, her voice low and menacing. Now you will join her. Desperately, Mrs. Mullen lunged for the stairs, the key clutched tightly in her hand. The figures chased her, their laughter echoing like a haunting melody. Just as she reached the door, she remembered the key and turned back to face them. You'll never take her! In a moment of sheer will, she threw the key toward the shadows. It hit the ground and exploded with a blinding light. The figures shrieked, recoiling from the brightness. And in that moment, Mrs. Mullen bolted out of the house, slamming the door behind her. She didn't stop running until she reached her own home. Breathless and shaken, she collapsed against the front door, her heart still racing. Days passed, and the Johnsons were never seen again. The house stood empty, the shadows lurking in the windows, waiting for their next victim. Mrs. Mullen never spoke of that day to anyone. But sometimes, late at night, she could hear the faint whispers carried by the wind, a soft voice pleading for help, reminding her of the girl who had vanished into the dark. Story number seven. It was late October when the leaves turned golden and the air turned crisp in the small town of Pine Hollow. Emily had recently moved into the neighborhood, eager to start fresh after a difficult year. The house she rented was charming, with a white picket fence and a wraparound porch, but something about it felt off. Her neighbor, Mr. Langston, lived in the aging house next door, a stark contrast to her brightly painted home. Uh, he was a reclusive man, often seen tending to his garden, muttering to himself. Emily had heard the local kids whisper tales about him, how he never spoke to anyone, and how strange noises emanated from his house at night. One evening, as Halloween approached, Emily noticed Mr. Langston working late in his garden, his back to her. Summoning her courage, she stepped outside to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Emily, she called out, forcing a friendly smile. He turned slowly, his face partially shadowed by the brim of his hat. Hello, he replied, his voice gravely. I'm Langston. It's nice to meet you. I just moved in. If you ever need anything, don't hesitate to ask. His gaze lingered on her for a moment, and she could see a flicker of something in his eyes. Curiosity? Fear? But then he turned back to his work without another word. The days passed, and Emily settled into her new home, yet her fascination with Mr. Langston grew. She noticed odd things, strange shapes moving in his attic window at night, and sometimes a soft, eerie melody drifting through the air, a haunting tune that sent shivers down her spine. Curiosity turned into an obsession. On Halloween night, when the air was thick with the scent of fallen leaves and candy, Emily found herself restless. Children roamed the streets in costumes, their laughter echoing around her, but she felt drawn to the mystery of Mr. Langston's home. She watched as he meticulously placed carved pumpkins on his porch, their grinning faces glowing in the twilight. Just as she was about to retreat, Mr. Langston glanced over at her, his expression unreadable. Would you like to come over for some cider? He called, startling her. Surprised and a little hesitant, Emily nodded, curiosity outweighing her apprehension. She stepped across the picket fence and approached his front door. The interior of Mr. Langston's house was dimly lit, shadows dancing on the walls, the smell of cinnamon and cloves filled the air. He gestured for her to sit at the small wooden table in the corner. As they sat, he poured two cups of steaming cider. I don't get many visitors, he said, his voice low. People tend to avoid me. I can see why, Emily replied cautiously, unsure of how to respond. You have quite the reputation. Mr. Langston chuckled softly, a sound that sent chills down her spine. Reputation can be misleading. Sometimes it's the quiet ones you have to watch out for. The evening wore on and the conversation drifted. Mr. Langston shared stories about the neighborhood's past, his voice growing more animated. But every so often, his gaze would drift to the attic door, 
an unsettling glimmer in his eyes. Have you ever been upstairs? Emily asked, her curiosity peaked. He paused, his expression darkening. No one goes up there. It's best left undisturbed. As the clock ticked on, Emily felt a pull toward the attic, an inexplicable urge to uncover what lay hidden. Can I see it? She blurted out. Mr. Langston hesitated, his brow furrowing. I don't think that's a good idea. But she was already standing, driven by a mix of fear and excitement. Please, I need to know. Reluctantly, he stood and led her to the creaky stairs, the air growing colder as they ascended. The attic door was slightly ajar, revealing a dim light spilling into the hallway. Stay close, he warned, his voice laced with tension. As they stepped inside, the atmosphere changed. The attic was cluttered with old furniture, dust particles swirling in the air like trapped spirits. But what caught Emily's attention was a large, antique mirror standing against the far wall, its surface cloudy and cracked. Don't touch it, Mr. Langston said sharply, but the words came too late. Emily had already approached the mirror, captivated by its eerie allure. As she gazed into the reflection, she gasped. The mirror didn't show her image. Instead, it revealed a shadowy figure lurking behind her, a grotesque shape with hollow eyes, grinning menacingly. Get away from there, Mr. Langston shouted, rushing toward her. But before he could reach her, the shadow lunged forward, breaking through the glass like a burst of dark smoke. Emily stumbled back, at the world spinning as she felt the chill of its presence wrapping around her. Mr. Langston grabbed her wrist, pulling her back just in time. You have to leave. It's not safe. The shadow shrieked, a sound that pierced the silence of the attic, and in a panic, Emily bolted down the stairs, heart racing. She burst through the front door, the cool night air hitting her like a slap. Behind her, she heard Mr. Langston's voice, strained and desperate. I tried to warn you. You shouldn't have looked. Emily didn't stop running until she was safely inside her home, locking the door behind her. The remnants of the evening hung in the air, a haunting melody echoing in her mind, the shadows lurking just out of sight. For days, she avoided Mr. Langston and his house. The neighborhood seemed darker, the whispers more pronounced. She heard rumors of past residents who had vanished without a trace, their spirits lingering in the air like autumn leaves. But one night, as Halloween returned to Pine Hollow, she heard a soft tapping at her window. She approached cautiously, peering through the glass. Mr. Langston stood outside, his face pale, eyes wide with desperation. Emily, please, I need your help, he pleaded, his voice trembling. What do you want? She asked, heart pounding. I can't hold it back anymore. It's coming for you, he warned, glancing nervously over his shoulder. I thought I could contain it, but it's too late. His you have to listen. Fear coursed through her, but beneath it she felt a strange pull. She opened the window, a crack. What do I need to do? There's a way to break the curse. You have to face it, together. We can't let it take anyone else. With no time to think, she nodded, adrenaline flooding her veins. As she climbed out the window, the night air felt charged with energy. They crept back to Mr. Langston's house, the shadows shifting like living entities around them. Inside, they rushed up to the attic. The mirror stood ominously, a portal to the darkness beyond. You have to confront it, Mr. Langston urged, his voice steadier now. With a deep breath, Emily stepped forward, gazing into the mirror once more. This time, she stood her ground as the shadowy figure reemerged, its grin wider, teeth sharper. Come to me, it hissed, its voice echoing through the attic, resonating in her bones. No, Emily shouted, defiance rising within her. You won't take anyone else. The shadow recoiled, twisting and writhing as if in pain. Mr. Langston joined her, chanting words she couldn't understand. Together, they pushed against the dark presence, a light emanating from their resolve. With one final cry, Emily focused on the shadow, pouring her strength into the moment. You have no power here. Leave this place. In a flash of blinding light, the shadow shattered, the mirror cracking and splintering into a thousand pieces. The room erupted in a whirlwind of energy before everything fell silent, the remnants of darkness dissipating like fog. Breathing heavily, Emily and Mr. Langston stood in the now empty attic, the air feeling lighter. It's over, he whispered, relief washing over his features. As they descended the stairs, the house felt different, cleansed, as if freed from a terrible burden. Emily turned to Mr. Langston, gratitude flooding her heart. Thank you for trusting me. He nodded, a small smile breaking through his earlier solemnity. Sometimes, facing our fears is the only way to break the chains. 
As she returned home, the moon cast a gentle glow over Pine Hollow. Emily looked up at the sky, feeling a sense of renewal wash over her. The shadows were gone, and with them, the weight that had hung over her neighborhood for too long. From that day on, Emily and Mr. Langston became friends, united by the harrowing experience. The neighborhood no longer felt haunted, but alive, a testament to the strength of facing one's fears, and together they watched the seasons change, their bond growing deeper with every passing day. Story number eight. In the quaint town of Maple Grove, change was a rarity. Most families had lived in their houses for generations, keeping a close-knit community feel. But everything shifted when the Johnsons moved into the old Anderson place at the end of the street. The house had been abandoned for years, its paint peeling and its yard overgrown with weeds. Rumors swirled about the last occupants, who vanished without a trace. Emily, a 12-year-old girl with an adventurous spirit, was both intrigued and frightened by the new neighbors. Her parents had warned her to keep her distance, but she found herself drawn to the old house. One foggy afternoon, she decided to investigate. As she approached, she noticed the front door ajar, creaking slightly in the breeze. Curiosity got the better of her. Emily stepped inside, the floorboards groaning under her weight. The air was musty, filled with the scent of mold and decay. Sunlight filtered through the cracked windows, casting eerie shadows across the walls. Dust motes danced in the light, making the space feel almost magical. Hello? She called out, her voice echoing in the silence. No answer. The house seemed abandoned, yet something felt off, as if she were not alone. As she explored the dimly lit rooms, Emily stumbled upon a staircase leading to the attic. A flicker of excitement coursed through her. Attics were always filled with hidden treasures. She climbed the creaking steps and pushed open the attic door, revealing a cluttered space filled with old trunks, cobwebs, and forgotten relics. In the corner, a large, ornate mirror caught her eye. It was covered with a thick layer of dust, but its frame was beautifully carved. Drawn to it, Emily brushed her fingers across the glass. As she did, a cold shiver raced down her spine and the reflection flickered. Suddenly, a pale face appeared behind her in the mirror. Startled, Emily whipped around, but there was no one there. Heart racing, she turned back to the mirror. The face was gone, but a whisper filled the air. Help us. Frightened but determined, Emily leaned closer to the mirror. Who are you? She asked, her voice trembling. We are trapped, the voice said, barely audible. We need your help to break the curse. What curse? Emily inquired, her heart pounding in her chest. The curse of the Johnsons. They are not who they seem, the voice warned. Find the truth before it's too late. Before Emily could respond, the mirror shimmered and the room filled with a blinding light. She shielded her eyes, and when she opened them again, she found herself standing in the same attic, but everything had changed. The dust was gone, the air felt charged with energy, and the mirror now glowed with a soft blue light. She glanced around, feeling a presence behind her. Turning slowly, she saw three figures materializing, ghostly, translucent forms of what looked like the previous occupants of the house. They were dressed in clothing from decades past, their faces somber and pleading. Please, you must help us the woman in the center said, her voice echoing with sorrow. We were the Andersons, and we were wronged. The Johnsons who now live here, they are not of this world. Emily felt a surge of courage. What do you want me to do? The locket, the woman said, pointing toward the mirror. It holds the key. You must find it and bring it to us. Determined, Emily reached into the mirror. It felt cold and fluid as she plunged her hand through the glass. To her surprise, she pulled out a small ornate locket, its surface shimmering with an otherworldly glow. Now return it to the house, the woman urged. But be careful, the Johnsons will try to stop you. With the locket in hand, Emily hurried back down the stairs, her heart racing. As she reached the front door, she heard footsteps behind her. Turning, she saw the Johnsons standing in the hallway, their eyes dark and unsettling. Where do you think you're going? Mr. Johnson asked, a chilling smile spreading across his face. You shouldn't be here. Emily's heart raced, but she knew she had to escape. I'm just leaving, she stammered, but she clutched the locket tightly. Not so fast, Mrs. Johnson hissed, her voice dripping with malice. You're not going anywhere. In that moment, the ghostly figures of the Andersons emerged from the mirror, their forms glowing brightly. Leave her alone, they commanded, their voices powerful and united. 
With a surge of energy, the Johnsons were pushed back, their faces twisting with rage. You think you can stop us? Mr. Johnson snarled, but the Andersons advanced, their spirits radiating light. Emily took her chance, racing past the Johnsons and out the front door. She sprinted across the yard, the locket guiding her toward the large oak tree that stood sentinel over the property. With every step, she could feel the warmth of the Andersons beside her, urging her forward. Reaching the tree, she pressed the locket into the bark, and suddenly, the ground trembled. The air crackled with energy as the locket fused with the tree, illuminating the yard with a brilliant glow. The Johnsons screamed in fury, their forms flickering like dying embers. No! Mrs. Johnson shrieked, her voice filled with anguish as the light enveloped them. The ground shook violently, and in a flash of blinding light, the Johnsons vanished, leaving nothing but silence in their wake. The air grew still, and the presence of the Andersons surrounded Emily like a warm embrace. Thank you, the woman said softly, her voice filled with relief. You've set us free. As the sun began to set, casting golden hues across the sky, the spirits of the Andersons smiled at Emily. You are brave and kind. We will watch over you, the woman whispered before their forms faded into the light. Emily stood alone in the yard, the weight of what had just happened settling upon her. The old house no longer felt menacing. Instead, it felt like a place of peace and resolution. The Johnsons were gone, and the Andersons were free at last. From that day forward, the neighborhood of Maple Grove flourished, the whispers of the past now replaced with laughter and joy. And Emily, forever changed by her experience, became the guardian of the stories that would keep the memory of the Andersons alive. Story number nine. In the quaint little town of Maplewood, where everyone knew their neighbors and gossip traveled faster than the wind, there was a house that stood out. The Peters' house was always shrouded in mystery. Its once vibrant red paint had faded to a ghostly pink, and the lawn was overgrown with weeds. Rumor had it that the owner, Mr. Peters, had passed away years ago, leaving the house empty, but occasionally a flicker of light would be seen in the upstairs window. The new neighbors, the Daniels family, moved in one sunny afternoon, bringing with them a sense of fresh energy. They were a cheerful bunch, always waving and smiling. However, the townsfolk whispered warnings. Stay away from that house, they said. It's haunted. The old man never left. Curiosity peaked. Twelve-year-old Jamie Daniels couldn't resist. He often watched the Peters' house from his bedroom window, captivated by the stories he heard. One evening, as dusk fell, Jamie saw a flickering light in the attic window. He decided he had to investigate. Mom, I'm going to explore the neighborhood, he shouted, grabbing his flashlight. Just stay close, Jamie, his mother called from the kitchen, but he was already out the door, heart racing with excitement. As he approached the old house, he felt a strange pull, as if the house was calling to him. The front door creaked ominously as he pushed it open. Inside, the air was thick with dust and the scent of decay. Cobwebs hung like curtains in the corners, and old furniture loomed like specters in the dim light. Jamie flicked on his flashlight and wandered further into the house. Each step echoed in the silence, amplifying his growing unease. The walls were lined with faded photographs of the Peters family, happy moments frozen in time, but there was something unsettling about their expressions, as if they were hiding secrets behind their smiles. He climbed the creaky staircase, each step a protest against his weight. When he reached the attic door, he hesitated. The flickering light grew brighter, beckoning him. Taking a deep breath, he opened the door, revealing a small, dusty room illuminated by a single candle. In the center of the room stood an old wooden table, and on it lay a faded photograph of Mr. Peters. His eyes seemed to follow Jamie, a haunting sadness lingering in the air. As Jamie stepped closer, he noticed a journal beside the photograph. Curious, he picked it up and began to read. The entries told a tragic tale. Mr. Peters had lost his wife many years ago, and since then he had lived in solitude, tormented by grief. The last entry chilled Jamie to the bone. I can feel her presence here, always watching. If I can just find a way to bring her back. Suddenly, a cold breeze swept through the room, extinguishing the candle and plunging the attic into darkness. Jamie's heart raced, and he could feel the oppressive weight of sorrow in the air. He heard a soft sobbing sound and turned to see a figure emerging from the shadows. It was a woman, translucent and ethereal, with a sorrowful expression. Jamie froze in fear but felt a strange sense of compassion for her. Who are you? He managed to whisper. I am Eleanor, 
Mr. Peter's wife, she said, her voice a soft echo. He can't let go. He believes I'm still with him, but I am trapped here, longing for peace. Jamie felt a wave of empathy wash over him. What can I do to help you? He asked, stepping forward. Eleanor pointed to the journal. You must make him understand. He needs to know I have moved on, that he must find his own way to the light. Determined, Jamie nodded. I'll help you. I promise. As he turned to leave, the room grew colder and the sobbing intensified. He sprinted down the stairs and out of the house, his heart pounding in his chest. The next day, Jamie went to see the Daniels family, gathering his courage to talk to his parents about Mr. Peters. He told them everything he had seen and felt, urging them to help him contact the elderly man's family. Together, they reached out to the Peters' relatives, who had long since moved away but were still in town. Jamie's parents invited them over, hoping to bring closure to the old man's tragic story. That evening, as the relatives gathered in the living room, Jamie shared what he had learned. The family listened intently, tears in their eyes. They revealed that Mr. Peters had indeed been haunted by his grief, and they had been too afraid to confront the pain of his loss. With the family's support, Jamie led them back to the old house. They gathered in the attic, candles lighting the way. Together, they read passages from Mr. Peter's journal, recalling memories of Eleanor and celebrating her life. As they spoke her name, a warmth enveloped the room, and Jamie felt a soft breeze caress his face. The atmosphere shifted, and a bright light filled the attic. Eleanor's figure appeared, her sorrow lifting as she smiled at her family. Thank you, she whispered, her voice echoing like a gentle breeze. In that moment, Jamie knew he had helped free Eleanor from her sorrow, and with a final grateful look, she faded into the light. The Peters' house changed after that day. The heaviness lifted and the air felt lighter. Mr. Peters' family began to restore the old house, turning it into a place of remembrance, a tribute to love and loss. And as for Jamie, he learned the importance of compassion, the, the power of memories, and that even the heaviest of hearts can find peace.